guys, it's Q. Thanks for joining us here at the Thoughts for Living podcast, where information is thoughtful and engaging. It's this week's episode. Hello, and welcome again to the Thoughts for Living podcast. We'd like to welcome you to this edition of the podcast. Today is August 14th, 2022. First of all, thank you for taking time to join us. You can find more information about today's topic and previous topics at thoughtsforliving.com. While there, you can download music as well. Thank you in advance for your continued support. Today, we'd like to do something a little different. We'd like to read from the work of theologian and scholar James H. Cohn who was the Distinguished Professor of Systematic Theology at Union Theological Seminary. We thought we'd read from Dr. Cohn today uh, because you've heard us say in, on many occasions that we would use ecological consciousness theory as a framework for helping us better understand how our environment impacts our consciousness, how consciousness impacts our culture, and how culture impacts our worldview, and how our worldview can help us or it can hinder us in making decisions in order to create a more sustainable world for us all. As a part of that theoretical framework of valuing the group, valuing collaboration, uh, valuing personhood, uh, the third part of that framework is spirituality. And we thought we'd share... uh, with you, uh, the writings of Dr. Cohn in that uh, his writings has have made a, a great impact on us and our ability to think about and to write about ecological consciousness theory and what spirituality really means in our lives. Uh, For some, spirituality might just simply be your personal um, relationship to the creator, how you identify the creator, the universe. Uh, For some, It's just your personal devotion, you could say. Uh, It might be your personal uh, meditation. Uh, It's just your one-on-one relationship with how you see the Creator. When we say spirituality, we not only recognize our individual relationship, but we take that further in our understanding and interpreting what scriptures has to say about Christology or has to say about Christ. I follow or try to follow to the best of my ability, the teachings of Christ. And as some of you 
would recognize uh, after Christ goes, um, comes out of the wilderness after being tempted, he goes into the synagogue and he reads from Isaiah. And what he reads uh, for many of us is the foundation of our faith that Christ has come to set the captives free. And our understanding, that understanding that we had uh, developed early on um, really was reinforced when we came to understand the writings of James Cone. Some of you may know it was it's a powerful thing to read what you've been thinking for a long time. To actually see someone else write what's been going on in your mind and in your being. And that was my experience in reading Cone and would like to share with you uh, his writings today after uh, just reading a short uh, bio of Dr. James H. Cone. He was born August the 5th in 1938 and uh, he just passed uh, in 2018. Uh, and as I said, he was a distinguished professor, a theologian, and he was best known for being what many call the father of black theology and the father of black liberation theology. Uh, in fact, in 1969, he wrote a book entitled Black Theology and Black Power. Uh, I would suggest you add that to your library. And uh, in uh, that book, uh, Dr. Cohn uh, suggested a new way to comprehensively define uh, black theology, and thereby the black church. Um, he was suggesting in that book that black power was an idea that black people were absolutely asserting their humanity. And they had to assert their humanity because white supremacy was trying to deny black people's humanity. And he identified all behaviors and actions that took place with the liberation of black people. He saw that as the gospel. Uh, because he understood that Jesus had come to liberate the oppressed. And so black people asserting themselves through the idea of black power, uh, black people loving themselves, right? Uh, loving our culture, our way of dressing, our style, loving our music, our cuisine and our art, loving each other. All of these acts, uh, including acts of civil disobedience in order to bring about uh, 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 the society, to bring the society to understanding that black people should be and must be and demanded that they be respected this was the gospel of Jesus Christ in action. 
And so in 1969, uh, he suggested that the, uh, the, 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 the theology he had lived with for the majority of his life, uh, that he had been trained uh, in school studying white theologians, um, it just did not allow him to make sense of what he was seeing in his everyday life of the brutality of black people. Uh, he, he lived and experienced the teachings of Dr. Martin Luther King, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., uh, our prophet, but also he lived and experienced the reality of another prophet, Brother Malcolm X. And Dr. Cohn was trying to, to wrestle with these two ideas. I think he said that Christianity, that aspect of him was reinforced by the teachings of Martin Luther King. But that black identity came from the teachings of Malcolm X. But at the time, there did not exist a way of interpreting scripture that would allow him to bring those two ideas together. His Christianity and his black identity. Because as Christianity has been, had been taught to him, it was taught to him from a Eurocentric perspective. It was taught to him the same way it was taught to all of us, has been taught to us. It has been taught to us in a way to, as a tool for us to surrender to our oppression under white supremacy. You know that teaching slaves obey your master, you know, turn the other cheek. All of, all of these uh, 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 pieces of, 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 of scripture that were taken out by uh, white supremacists who wanted to keep us in bondage. And Dr. Cohn suggests that having learned Christianity that way, that, that way of seeing Christianity couldn't allow him to, to, to justify what he was seeing going on with the civil rights movement and the movement for black people to demand their humanity. And so in 1969, he wrote the book, Black Theology, and black power. After writing that book in 1969, in 1970, he wrote the book that impacted me, which was entitled A Black Theology of Liberation. A Black Theology of Liberation. And this text, uh, is profound. As I said, uh, what was important for me was that this was the first theological text that I read where the writer, it was as if he had uh, taken the thoughts right out of my head and put them on paper. And we thought we'd share with you today the writings of James H. Cone, and I'm reading from A Black Theology of Liberation, the 20th Anniversary Edition. Chapter 1, The Content of Theology, Liberation as the Content of Theology. Christian theology is a theology of liberation. 
It is a rational study of the being of God in the world in the light of existential situation of an oppressed community relating to the forces of liberation to the essence of the gospel, which is Jesus Christ. This means that its sole reason for existence is to put into ordered speech the meaning of God's activity in the world so that the community of the oppressed will recognize that its inner thrust for liberation is not only consistent with the gospel, but is the gospel of Jesus Christ. There can be no Christian theology that is not identified unreservedly with those who are humiliated and abused. In fact, theology ceases to be a theology of the gospel when it fails to arise out of the community of the oppressed. For it is impossible to speak of the God of Israelite history, who is the God revealed in Jesus Christ, without recognizing that God is the God of and for those who labor and are overladen. The perspective and direction of this study are already made clear. The reader is entitled to know at the outset what is considered to be important. My definition of theology and the assumptions on which it is based are to be tested by the working out of a theology which can be judged in terms of its consistency with a communitarian view of the ultimate. We begin now by exploring some preliminary considerations in my definition. The, nef the definition of theology as the discipline that seeks to analyze the nature of of the Christian faith in the light of the oppressed arises chiefly from biblical tradition itself. Number one, though it may not be entirely clear why God elected Israel to be God's people, one point is evident. The election is inseparable from the event of the Exodus. Quote, <clears throat> You have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now, therefore, if you will obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my own possession among all peoples. Exodus 9, 4 through 5. End quote. Certainly, this means, among other things, that God's call on this people is related to its oppressed condition and to God's own liberating activity already seen in the Exodus. You have seen what I did. By delivering this people from Egyptian bondage, and inaugurating the covenant on the basis of that historical event, God is revealed as the God of the oppressed, involved in their history, liberating them from human bondage. Number two, later stages of Israelite history also show that God is particularly concerned about the oppressed within the community of Israel. 
The rise of Old Testament prophecy is due primarily to the lack of justice within that community. The prophets of Israel are prophets of social justice, reminding the people that Yahweh is the author of justice. It is important to note in this connection that the righteousness of God is not an abstract quality in the being of God, as with Greek philosophy. It is rather God's active involvement in history, making right what human beings have made wrong. The consistent theme in Israelite prophecy is Yahweh's concern for the lack of social, economic, and political justice for those who are poor and unwanted in society. Yahweh, according to Hebrew prophecy, will not tolerate injustice against the poor. God will vindicate the poor. Again, God is revealed as the God of liberation for the oppressed. Number three. In the New Testament, the theme of liberation is reaffirmed by Jesus himself. The conflict with Satan and the powers of this world, the condemnation of the rich, the insistence that the kingdom of God is for the poor, and the locating of his ministry among the poor. These and other features of the career of Jesus show his work was directed to the oppressed for the purpose of their liberation. To suggest that he was speaking of a spiritual liberation fails to take seriously Jesus' thoroughly Hebrew view of human nature. Entering to the kingdom of God means that Jesus himself becomes the ultimate loyalty of humankind, for he is the kingdom. This view of existence in the world has far-reaching implications for economic, political, and social institutions they can no longer have ultimate claim on human life. Human beings are liberated and thus free to rebel against all powers that threaten human life. This is what Jesus had in mind when he said, quote, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because... He has anointed me to preach the good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and the recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Luke 4, 18 through 19. End quote. In view of the biblical emphasis on liberation, it seems not only appropriate but necessary to define the Christian community as the community of the oppressed, which Jesus Christ joins in his fight for the liberation of humankind. I'm going to read that again. In view of the biblical emphasis, the Bible's emphasis on liberation, it seems not only appropriate but necessary to define the Christian community as the community of the oppressed, which joins Jesus Christ in his fight for the liberation of humankind. 
The task of theology then is to explicate or explain the meaning of God's liberating activity so that those who labor under enslaving powers will see that the forces of liberation are the very activity of God. Christian theology is never just a rational study of the being of God. Rather, it is a study of God's liberating activity in the world, God's activity in behalf of the oppressed. If the history of Israel and the New Testament description of the historical Jesus reveal that God is a God who is identified with Israel because it is an oppressed community, the resurrection of Jesus means that all oppressed people become his people. Herein lies the universal note implied in the gospel message of Jesus. The resurrection event means that God is liberating, excuse me, that God's liberating work is not only for the house of Israel, but for all who are enslaved by the principalities and powers. The resurrection event means that God's liberating work is not only for the house of Israel, but for all who are enslaved by principalities and powers. The resurrection conveys hope in God. Nor is this the hope that promises a reward in heaven in order to ease the pain of injustice on earth. Rather, it is hope which focuses on the future in order to make us refuse to tolerate present inequities. To see the future of God as revealed in the resurrection of Jesus is to see also the contradiction of any earthly injustice with existence in Jesus Christ. That is why Camillo Torres was right when he described revolutionary action as a Christian, a priestly struggle. The task of Christian theology, then, is to analyze the meaning of hope in God in such a way that the oppressed community of a given society will risk all for earthly freedom, a freedom made possible in the resurrection of Jesus. The language of theology cha challenges societal structures because it is inseparable from the suffering community. Theology can never be neutral or fail to take sides on issues related to the plight of the oppressed. I want to pause right there for a second. I've been engaged with some supporters and friends who uh, were trying to say that uh, Jesus and God are not political. Uh, some of these same people would say that, uh, you know, when you preach, you just preach about, you know, heaven and spiritual things. But Dr. Cohn is reminding us that Theology is never neutral, which is to say it is never non-political. You know, because to be political is about power. And when you deal with power, you have to choose sides. Most people try to choose to be on the side of the powerful. But thank God Jesus decided to be on the, pie, on the side 
of the powerless, the oppressed. Thank God that God decided not to be on the side of the powerful, but to be on the side of the powerless. Theology can never be neutral or fail to take sides on issues related to the plight of the oppressed. For this reason, it can never engage in conversation about the nature of God without confronting those elements of human existence which threaten anyone's existence as a person. Whatever theology says about God and the world must arise out of its sole reason for existing for existence as a discipline to assist the oppressed in their liberation. This is what Cohn is saying is the sole reason for the existence of theology uh, and for all that matter for the existence of God is to assist the oppressed in their liberation. Its language is always language about human liberation, proclaiming the end of bondage and interpreting the religious dimensions of revolutionary struggle. Liberation and Black Theology Unfortunately, American white theology has not been involved in the struggle for black liberation. It has been basically a theology of the white oppressor giving religious sanction to the genocide of indigenous people. Uh, he has here Ameri Ameri Indians and the enslavement of Africans. From the very beginning to the present day, American white theological thought has been patriotic, either by defining the theological task independently of black suffering, the liberal northern approach, or by defining Christianity as compatible with white racism, the conservative southern approach. In both cases, theology becomes a servant of the state, and that can only mean death to blacks. It is little wonder that an increasing number of black religionists are finding it difficult to be black and to be identified with traditional theological forms. The appearance of black theology on the American scene, then, is due primarily to the failure of white religionists to relate the gospel of Jesus to the pain of being black in a white racist society. It arises from the need of blacks to liberate themselves from white oppressors. Black theology is a theology of liberation because it is a theology which arises from an identification with the oppressed blacks of America, seeking to interpret the gospel of Jesus in the light of the black condition. It believes that the liberation of the black community is God's Liberation. The task of black theology, then, is to analyze the nature of the gospel of Jesus Christ in the light of oppressed blacks, so they will see the gospel as inseparable from their humiliated condition and as bestowing on them the necessary power to break the chains of oppression. This means that it is a theology of and for the black community seeking to interpret the religious dimensions of the forces of liberation in that community. There are two reasons why black theology is Christian theology. First, 
There can be no theology of the gospel which does not arise from an oppressed community. This is so because God is revealed in Jesus as a God whose righteousness is inseparable from the weak and helpless in human society. The goal of black theology is to interpret God's activity as related to the oppressed black community. Secondly, black theology is Christian theology because it centers on Jesus Christ. There can be no Christian theology which does not have Jesus Christ as its point of departure. Though black theology affirms the black condition as the primary datum of reality to be reckoned with, this does not mean that it denies the absolute revelation of God in Jesus Christ. Rather, it reaffirms it. Unlike white theology, which tends to make the Jesus event an abstract, unembodied idea, black theology believes that the black community itself is precisely where Jesus Christ is at work. The Jesus event in 20th century America is a black event. That is, an event of liberation taking place in the black community in which black recognize that it is incumbent upon them to throw off the chains of white oppression by whatever means they regard as suitable. This is what God's revelation means to black and white America and why black theology is an indispensable theology for our time. Well, as you can see, we all see the world differently. Thank you for joining us today on Thoughts for Living podcast. Please subscribe and visit us at www.thoughtsforliving.com for more episodes. Thank you again. Please email us with your thoughts if you have any.